Wow. Welcome back to our Tuesday morning meeting. I'm so happy to be here with you all. It seems like not that long ago, I was talking with you about setting my intention to create a golden summer for myself and my family. And here we are on the other end of summer. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today is how it went, how the golden summer went. I'm Dr. Robin McKay, your host. Welcome back. For those of you who are joining me live on LinkedIn, I'd love to see you say hello in the comments. And please leave at least your first name so I can say hi back because the platform I'm using doesn't always show me who is commenting. And this, just to kind of set the tone for what we're doing here and set the stage, really, this is a part of my Mindset RX podcast, which you can find on all of your podcast listening platforms. But this Tuesday morning meeting is specifically for my colleagues, clients, students, friends, everyone on LinkedIn. You know, I worked in corporate for a long time, and I have been consulting and coaching as an executive coach, corporate leaders for holy smokes, even before I got my PhD. So that was a long time ago, maybe like 15 years ago, I started doing this work. So corporate is continues to be near and dear to my heart, especially in the last few years, I've done so much advising with corporate leaders on topics like burnout, especially uh, bringing innovation back, getting back into the office. And so this season of our Mindset RX that's geared toward our LinkedIn colleagues is really going to be about the mindset. And it's specifically geared toward leaders, CEOs who have ADHD or who think they do. Because one of the things that happened during my golden summer is that I really drilled down even further and took a look at exactly who I'm working with, who's coming in for executive coaching, the kinds of people who I'm interacting with in the corporate space, whether it's at Intel or Experian or Nike or any of the, the organizations that I've been working with. And one of the things that everyone shares in common is that in some way, they have a twice exceptional brain. So what does that mean? It means that not only are they very bright, talented, and accomplished, they also have something else going on in the brain. It's called neurodiversity. Where I like to focus is on ADHD, but there are very accomplished, very talented, and bright women in the workplace, as you know, you're maybe one of them if you're listening, um, who have something else going on. It could be anxiety, depression, some kind of mood disorder, it could be hormonal changes brought on by perimenopause. It could be things going on in the brain because of burnout. One of my colleagues, Dr. Romy, calls it busy brain syndrome. So those are a couple of ways that you can identify to make sure you're in the right place. And um, so you can look forward to Tuesday morning meetings, put them in your calendars. And we're going to be talking about mindset, energy work, intuition, all the things that I have found to be incredibly supportive to actualizing my highest potential and helping my clients to do the same thing, whether they're in the corporate space or not. But especially for you all who are in the corporate space, I think that one of the things that has come to light this summer is how important the inner work is how important the inner work is to recover from burnout, how important the inner work, the inside job is to making the most of your leadership, of being the type of leader that you really want to be and that sort of thing. So welcome. Let's, um, let's go ahead and dive into content today, shall we? I always like to start my Tuesday morning meetings with just a little bit of breath work. So breathe in love and grace. So just go ahead and close your eyes if you can. If you're obviously driving or someplace where it's not safe to close your eyes, don't. Or if you don't feel like it, don't. But if you can, just close your eyes and breathe in and breathe out and breathe in and breathe out again. Just paying attention to your breath, which brings you back into the present moment brings you back into the now space and allows you the opportunity to set aside all of the 
other stuff you've got going on, all of the other duties, responsibilities, obligations, anything that might be tugging at your consciousness, you can just set those aside for the time being. And then we will come back into this place of the present moment where anything is possible. In the present moment, anything is possible. So breathe in one more time and breathe out. I say hello to my live viewers, crystals on the, on the session today. Welcome, Crystal. It's good to see you here. Okay, so let's talk golden summer results, shall we? If you remember back in May, I published an episode on how to create your golden summer. And if you haven't listened to that, go ahead. Well, you're welcome to go back and listen to it. We can put the link in the show notes so that you have access to that. But basically what I said was that my intention for the summer that was going to be that I was creating a golden summer. What does that mean to me? It meant that it was timeless. It meant that I wanted to savor every moment of the summer. I wanted to enjoy the summer with my husband and with our golden doodle puppy Cooper. And I didn't want to get to this day. I didn't want to get to this day feeling like I hadn't actually experienced summer. You know how you do that? Like you have best, you know, best laid plans and then things go sideways at work or in your life. And then all of a sudden you get to the end of summer and you're like, what just happened? I don't even remember if I had a summer. That was the last thing that I wanted to do because I think that as maybe it's, I'm Gen X. I've been, this is not my first rodeo. I've been around for a while. And I just, I feel like that, If I could advise my younger self on this, I would say savor, savor your life more. Don't wait until later to savor your life. And so that's what I really did this summer. And that's maybe what you did too. And if not, you can always take what I'm going to share with you today and apply it to the coming months as well. It doesn't have to be a golden summer. It can be a golden month. It could be a golden day if you want to, but it's all about savoring. So I want to start, I took some notes so that I could kind of organize my thoughts. There were a couple of things that I wanted to share with you about how the golden summer went. It really was a summer of savoring. We split our time between our home in Arizona, where it's 9,000 degrees in the summertime, and our home away from home in San Diego County. Um, we took Cooper there for the first time, our little puppy um, had, we walked him on the beach and just developed a really wonderful routine of working in the mornings. I held office hours. So, or I'm sorry, I held summer hours with my, with my company. So we ended work at 1.30 in the afternoon every single day that um, we were out on the coast. And that really actually, I think that was a game changer in terms of my ability to savor this summer is that I had a definite stop point to my work day. Now in the past, you might relate to this. I have been a chronic overworker. I love my business. I love my clients. I love the work that I do. And it's easy for me to just keep working. And I'm constantly driven to create something new, to make contributions, to master things. Like that's my MO from the time I was a little kid. So for me to set a hard stop for my daily schedule was something that took some, took some decision making. And it also was a little bit, it felt a little unsteady to me actually, because it was something new that I was trying, but it turned out really well because, um, my husband has, um, he works, uh, stock market hours, which I think ends at like, I always forget what time it ends, I guess one o'clock Pacific time this time of year. So he was done by one. He does a little bit of work on the other end, side of that. So by by 1.30 or 2 o'clock, we were done for the day. We'd go to the beach. We'd walk Cooper. We'd go have gelato at the local gelato store, which was so delicious and also a little bit regretful in terms of my waistline. But it's part of the golden summer, I guess, just to enjoy and savor. So that was one thing that was one thing that I did in order to create the conditions for my golden summer to materialize. 
The other thing that I realized as I was kind of moving through this, these summer months is that energy followed my decision. You've heard maybe in the past that energy follows intention. That is, it kind of lands for me, but it's always been something that I've been like, mm, you know, I can intend something, but it doesn't always like that word, I think for me, doesn't always land, but decision that lands for me. So what I realized was at the beginning of the summer, when I said I'm creating a golden summer, that was actually a decision. It was a sacred promise to myself, really, that I was doing this. So when you set a sacred promise to yourself, when you decide that you're going to experience something, the energy, your behaviors, the way you look at the world, your perspective, all follow that sacred decision. That's what I learned this summer. So that's that was something that I want us to just take into the next part of the year is that your energy will follow your sacred intention. So how did that play out? Well, I don't remember when it was. I guess it was back in June. Cooper learned how to swim. Cooper is a golden doodle. His granddad is a golden retriever. So he has, you know, the, the genetics for it, certainly. But, oh, early in the early days, even in May, he would kind of prance around the pool and sniff it and not want to get in. Well, listen. When I was in undergrad, I taught, I don't even know how many kids how to swim, let's say a thousand, maybe more than that. But over the course of the time I was working at the swim school and running it, I probably taught at least a thousand kids how to swim. And I was always the one who got the criers and the ones who had the eye, eye goggles and the ear plugs and the nose plugs and all the things. And they were always scared of the water. Well, I just channeled my inner swimming teacher, Miss Robin. And Sure enough, step by step, day by day, we coaxed Cooper into the water, got him chest high, and then eventually got him swimming across the pool. And let me tell you, it was not elegant. It was so not elegant. He looked like he did not look like a seal in the water. He looked like he was flapping around and his big paws would come up and splash the water. And, but he somehow made it across. And now we can't get him out of the water, frankly. But I remember one day early, it might have been one of the first times he swam on his own across the pool. I sat there and watched him. And it was a moment where I came into conscious contact with my decision to create the golden summer. And I, I sat there and I just reflected, this is a golden summer moment. It was a golden summer moment. And I anchored that and it, it, it became sort of this core memory around the summertime. One of those sacred moments that's timeless that I would never forget. I would never forget. I will always remember that moment of sitting in the pool, watching Cooper swimming across the pool, celebrating with my husband who was also there with us. It was just a really special moment. And that was a moment that I marked consciously as an indicator that I was experiencing the golden summer. So flash forward to just last week when we were on the beach, we were on the beach for the last time actually, as we were getting ready to head back to Scottsdale the next day. And my husband and I were there, Cooper was at his pet sitter and we had swum in the ocean. The waves were easy enough for us to be, be out there for a while. They weren't pounding us. It was just, it was a nice, easy, gentle day in the ocean. So we swam in the ocean for, I don't know, let's say 15, 20 minutes or something. We came out, we're salty, wet, hair is a mess, dripping with, with ocean water. We go back to our beach towels under our umbrella and we sit there. I put my cowgirl hat on and it was another one of those moments. We just laughed and we looked at each other and it was just one of those sweet, sweet, timeless moments, a sacred moment really where once again, I was reminded, this is your golden summer. So I wanna just take it to you for just a second. And I want you to think about those moments in your own life, whether or not you decided that you were gonna create a golden summer is a little bit beside the point, but you can kind of look at over the course of the last couple of months, where were those moments of timelessness? Where were those moments where I felt truly and deeply connected with my life? 
Where were those moments where I didn't feel like I was kind of flying by the seat of my pants, but I was truly anchored in to the energies, to the, to the timelessness of the moment. And it's okay if you can't, it's okay if you can't see those moments right now. One of the reasons I wanted to do this episode is to teach you just the, the practice of paying attention on purpose to your present moment. We do that as a mindfulness practice in order to train our brains to, you know, be more productive and, and be less pissy with people or whatever it is, whatever you're dealing with, um, with your nervous system, but the benefit of it, the true benefit of it is a sense of timelessness, a sense of being truly and deeply connected with your life. I don't want to miss another moment of my life. And maybe you feel the same. And yet life can pass us by. Time is slippery. And the best way that I know how to really stand in those moments is to just be paying attention on purpose. So let's say you didn't have a golden summer. Let's say that the summer slipped through your fingers and before you knew it, you're back at work. The kids are back at school. You're, make, you're in transition, whatever is going on in your life. You can still use this episode, use this teaching to create these timeless golden moments in your life too. Remember this, energy follows your decision, or as I like to call it, a sacred promise to yourself. The second thing, and I, I gave the examples, but I actually have a name for what what these examples are. They're called magic moments. Those moments sitting in the pool with Cooper and my husband or sitting on the beach with my husband and just recognizing the timelessness, the sweetness, the, the um, like time stands still. Those are magic moments. And those are moments to me that indicated and reminded me that I was on that pathway of the golden summer. So look for the magic moments in your own life. And even if you have to go back and review in your memory the last couple of months, see if you can tag a couple of those timeless moments that you recognized, but you didn't necessarily acknowledge or sit in or savor. And then just call them up in your mind's eye, call them up in your heart and savor them now. Not as a longing, not as a regret, but just as an appreciation for, yeah, that was one of those moments. That was one of those magic moments. It reminds me of that song from, I think it was on the Grease soundtrack, Those Magic Moments by, who knows, somebody in the Drifters or something from the 50s. Um, and the third thing that I want to just share with you about this golden summer is that golden does not mean perfect. Oh, far from it. Far from it. So I don't want us to assume that just because you're setting the intention or making the decision to have a golden summer, that that summer is going to be perfect. Certainly mine was far from perfect. Um, not, not anything traumatic, not anything big, but just like, you know, there are moments of life when you live with another human and we're, we're raising Cooper and Cooper's still a nutty puppy. And there's, there's things that just happen during the day. One of the things that, and it's such a simple thing, but it's one of the things that indicates a, a couple of things about me. One is that, remember, I have an ADHD brain. Here's how it showed up on our last trip to California. I packed all my gear. I'm a really good packer. I've traveled a lot. I know what I need. And I just recently switched over from monthly contacts to daily contacts. So the optometrist had sent me an en enormous box filled with daily contacts. And the morning that we got up to leave for our trip, we drove six hours to the beach. I um, grabbed two boxes, two full boxes of contact lenses. I bet you can see where this is going. So I grabbed the two box of contacts, throw them in my bag and away we go. And I get to Carlsbad the next morning. I wake up, I go to put my contacts in and guess what? I had 
two boxes of my right contacts and zero boxes of my left contact. And you know what? It was one of those moments where I could have, you know, spun up about it and gotten all dramatic and how are we going to do this? But I just, for whatever reason, I think it's, well, I shouldn't say I know why this is because I'm in constant contact with my own intuition. I was just like, you know what? I'm going to call my optometrist in Scottsdale and we'll figure it out. One way or the other, I made another decision, a sacred promise to myself that I was going to have my left eye contact ASAP. So long story short, three hours later, my optometrist in Scottsdale had contacted an optometry place in Carlsbad. They just happened to have two boxes of disposable daily lenses. They gave me a backup lens for that would last a month. And I had enough to get through. I had 10 contacts. We were there for, I think, 10 days. And that was it. It was non-dramatic, but it was just like one of those moments. Like I was like, oh, I'm so dumb. Like, I'm so dumb. Like, what was I thinking? Not to be too hard on myself, but it's just, it's those moments that I think we can really get spun up about if we're not careful, if we're not mindful, if we're not paying attention on purpose. And then, uh, oh, the other thing that went sideways was on our first, on our first trip to Carlsbad, we had reserved a house to stay in for two weeks. The house wasn't available until the next day. So we got a small place, no dogs allowed. So I put Cooper, I did some research and I found a, a boarding kennel that I could put him in overnight. Well, that was an unmitigated disaster. He, there was nobody to spend the night with them. Did you know that? I didn't know that. There are kennels, apparently, a lot of them don't have overnight people staying with the boarded dogs. I was stunned by that, but we were kind of out of options. So we were like, okay, we'll just, you know, I'm sure it'll be fine. There won't be a fire or something. They were like, well, we have cameras. Well, seriously, like what good does cameras do if no, nobody's on the scene? Like really? Anyway, I prayed over it. I blessed the mess. And away we went, we came back the next day to get him. And you would have thought we were breaking him out of canine penitentiary. He was so excited to see us. I've never seen this dog so excited to see my husband and me ever. Usually he sees us and he greets us like milk toast. And this time he was like all over it. He was begging to get out. And, you know, who knows? I don't know what happened. He wasn't worse for the wear necessarily. But was one of those moments that I was again, I was like, oh, that kind of went sideways and we didn't have a lot of options. And so we made the best of kind of a crummy situation and, you know, there's no lasting damage or effects of it other than it created a story for us to tell about how, you know, next time check to make sure somebody's spending the night with your pets when you are boarding them. I guess that's the lesson learned there. But remember this, that golden does not equal perfect. So those are the things that stood out for me about this summer. The other thing, so those are the personal things. The professionally, a couple of things showed up that I wanted to share with you all because it involves you, actually. One is that, as I alluded to at the beginning of our time together, I've really made the decision that I'm focusing on accomplished, still accomplished, still talented women leaders, CEOs, engineers, physicians who happen to have a little ADHD on the side. Now, listen, I've always focused on you all, but I've never said it out loud. Like you all find your way to me, but I've never said it out loud. So now I'm saying it out loud. And the reason that I am is because now more than ever before, neurodiversity in the workplace is, is especially valuable. It's especially important. And it's, there's a need to gain acceptance and understanding among our neurotypical colleagues. This is something that I was missing when I was in corporate. I didn't, by the way, I didn't know that I had ADHD until I was in my mid thirties. And by that time I had kind of finished my corporate space, my corporate career as a, as a, uh, a full-time employee, we'll say. And I was working more in the consulting space and executive coaching at that time. So it's a little bit different in how I was interacting is my point with, with corporate. But um, 
one of the things that I really want to get across this year for the rest of this year and into next year and to the foreseeable future is that those of us who have brains that are different, that don't think the same way, that have different perspectives are actually our workplace's greatest gift because we are kind of the unicorns and we are the innovators and we're the visionaries. All of the things that corporate values, but it can be misunderstood, especially if you haven't invented the thing or come up with the idea or, you know, generated something that the organization can't live without. In fact, that's kind of a key to the innovators is a lot of times we do have ADHD brains and people don't know what to do with us until we invent the thing that they didn't know they couldn't live without. So that's my mission, starting effective immediately. And part of it too is that I'm not going to be doing a whole lot of like behavioral hacks for increasing productivity or, you know, decreasing procrastination or any of the things that go along with ADHD. Although I will say that I think it's important for us to understand how our brains work and kind of what the behavioral consequences are of having an ADHD brain. But what I will say is that the, the things that I'm going to be focusing on and working on is giving you more access to your gifts, to focusing on what making what's right more right for you to coming up with ways of explaining our brains to neurotypicals that we work with, to gaining acceptance for neurodiverse people in the workplace. And um, I'd love your help with that. I'd love you to spread the word in your organization as well as the Doc Robbins on the scene with neuro neurodiversity and the consequences of that, whether it's burnout, whether it's, you know, bumping up against your glass ceiling, whether it's imposter syndrome, anything that is kind of pressing your buttons right now. These are things that there, there are specific methods, there are specific practices that you can do to kind of shift your perspective so you can move around those challenges more easily and access your highest potential for your highest good. So you can have golden summers, but also for the contributions that you're meant to be making in your organization as well. So if that's something that lands for you, if you would like my support on that, if you would like to have some conversations about how I can come into your organization and, and start or extend the conversation on neurodiversity, I want you to reach out for, reach out to me. Um, we'll put my email address in the show notes, but you can always just direct message me on LinkedIn and I will be sure to see your message and get with you that way as well. All right. So with that, with that, put your Tuesday morning meetings on the calendar. We're going to be doing this pretty much rain or shine every Tuesday morning, 830 Pacific, 1130 Eastern. And I think it's like 430 in the UK this time of year. So check your, check your local schedule for when that's showing up in live for you. And yeah, tell your friends, tell your neurodiverse friends to join us too, because we need to link arms with each other. The first place that I believe that we can do the most work and have the most impact is if we ourselves, those of us who do have neurodiverse brains, get some acceptance about ourselves and understand our brains and understand how we operate differently than neurotypicals. And when we start accepting ourselves in that way, other people, it's going to build the bridge for other people to do so as well. All right. Big love. I will see you guys next week.